Oops, an idea why you should be done. Yes. Sure. Okay. And finally, tomorrow, but then tomorrow, I'll, I'll work through a paper, a recent paper that I finished with a colleague at, in Columbia Math named Marcel Nutz, who has done, uh, which, which oh, you know, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk especially about the idea of shorting and the, and how motivated, why it's so important to understand bubbles, how bubbles end, what, sh what happens with shorting, we'll talk about that. And the third lecture, which is the Arrow Lecture on Sunday, right, I'll discuss what does that tell about the market for art? So I'm going to take the ideas, exactly the ideas we have on speculation, and use data from the art market, mainly data from auctions of, of artists, and tell you why is it that that, that theory explained what some important, what I deem important features of the, of the market for, for, pay, for art in general, not only paintings, but art in general. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk is that why do you want to talk about difference in beliefs? That's the first item. Then I'm going to talk about difference in beliefs in asset pricing. I'll go very fast about the two-period model short-selling constraints, which is 30-year-old model or 40-year-old model, but it's worthwhile looking at it. Then I'll talk about the infinite horizon model with risk neutral agents and short-selling constraints. That's the work that derives from an early paper by Harrison and Krebs that spent maybe 20 years, 20 years with, the, with very little attention from the profession, even though there was another very, another very important Harrison Krebs paper written the same year, but this one was not cited. And now people came back to it thanks to these connections with bubbles, et cetera, that people got interested in that. I'm going to talk very fast about some empirical evidence. I'll talk about generalization. Then I'll discuss collateral and leverage. That gets from the work of John Janakopoulos, but in particular I'm going to show you some work that Simsek did and how it relates to some of the ideas here and how do we, can we lo look at the, you know, what it says about the crisis of 2008. And finally, I'm going to talk about shorting. So shorting is going to be in the lecture, the next lecture. It's a more technical paper. I think it's worthwhile going through it because there are techniques there which I, which, uh, I find very useful for many, many different occasions. So if you, if you want to do theory, there are techniques there that are being, going to be useful for you. Um, and the paper itself has some interesting <laughs> economics, but I'm saying both of the things. But I'm going to go more detail about the proof techniques in the, in, in the last one. And then, of course, the art is not here because it's not part of this lecture. The art is going to be the Arrow Lecture on Sunday. So the first thing I want to start is that uh, we spent, by the way, um, we spent a lot of time uh, in economics, and I think it was very well spent time deriving things we can call no trade results, or I can't, you can't agree to disagree. A lot of that was done not exactly in this building, but, but with people that had offices in this building and so on, is a really Israeli topic. Um, the version I'm going to show you is a result, I think, of a PhD dissertation written when Eric, with Eric as a supervisor. Right? This is part of John Tiholsky's, I, I, I think. Um, and that's the version I'm going to give here. But there were a lot of ideas like that coming in. And it's basically the idea that you cannot trade out of information in a completely rational world. Okay? And this very simple model tells you how that goes. And then we can say what you have to do to modify. So I'm going to start with a model with, a, with a, an asset in zero net supply. So it's one of those inside assets that Peter was talking about today. There's a payoff next period. There's a price P at time zero. And there's a bunch of risk neutral agents that receive the signal. Uh, and they can choose any position provided they don't pass a certain absolute value of the position. They can go long and short up to a certain total absolute value. Okay? And I'm going to write the signal. This is the aggregate signal observed by the economy. Nobody observes sigma, but people, different individuals observe different parts of sigma. So the vector sigma 1 to sigma i, they could be overlapped, they could be the same information, that, that, that's completely immaterial. And a pricing function is a function of the aggregate signal, okay? Um, and given that pricing function and given the observed P, the actual price that you observe, and this, the information of each agent, agent is going to choose a position that maximizes its expected return, okay? So that's how much condition, of course, they're all risk neutral, so you just look at the expected value, but condition on the information they receive, which is on sigma i and p. They observe the price. 
okay? And we call the rational expectation equilibrium a price such that supply equals demand. In this case, supply is zero, so demand has to add up to zero. Okay, so that's a very, as Peter would say, very simple. Uh, now, here's the proposition, okay? That if P is a rational expectation equilibrium, then zero is a solution to all agents maximization problems. So in any equilibrium, agents might as well go home and sleep. Okay, they're just indifferent. They may choose something else, but they might as well go home and sleep. So, uh, how do we prove something like that? The proof is very, is very, is very illustrative of what's going on. The first thing you know that zero is always possible action. So the expected return of any agent has to be greater than equal to zero. The expected payoff, otherwise, uh, you just do zero. And then you use the law of iterated expectation. What the law of iterated expectation? Uh, uh, allows you to do is to first condition P and then find that's good so that it's just condition P now when you take we take some random variable which is has an expected value greater equal to condition something the unconditional random variable also has to have an expected value greater equal to zero so we kind of get rid of the inf of the sigma I by just forgetting about conditioning on that. That's a concept of the law of iterated expectations. Okay, and now you sum over all, 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 all agents. This sum has to be greater to zero. Now you use the fact that supply is equal, that first of all, omega minus P, that's just a common term in this expectation. All that comes out is theta I because you only now condition on the price. So you get the expected value W minus P times the sum. So W minus P times the sum is the fact that uh, sum of conditions sum of conditional expectation expect is, the expect is the conditional expectation of the sum. And now that you have this sum here, you use the supply equals demand, this is zero, so that you get a zero. So you get a sum of non-negative numbers that add up to zero, they have to all be zero. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's the reason. Now, okay, now how do you get out of something like this, okay? One way to do it is to say, look, there are people out there who don't make money trading. Those are the famous noise traders. So in the models that Peter was talking about, there are people out there that they don't make money out of trading. Okay? And so if they are willing to lose money because of hedging reasons or whatever. Uh, now, some of my old colleagues at Chicago used to complain about noise traders. They say, where do those noise traders come from? Well, they were needed to make the model work, whatever. Okay, so. Uh, Anyway, asymmetric information per se is not necessarily a source of trading. There could be a source of trading, provided there are some people stupid enough so you could use your asymmetric information they, because of liquidity or whatever reason they want. So here are some facts. Now, when I do this with my undergraduates at Columbia, Rishab can tell, us, can tell you this, I make you calculate, uh, them calculate all those numbers from first principles. They have to figure out how to calculate these numbers. I'm not gonna do this with you, the one number I don't have them calculate is this one. So if you look at the amount of foreign exchange trading, and that's just the so-called G7 currencies, which are no longer seven, but still calling G7 because the euro absorbed a bunch of currencies, so there are less than seven G7 cur currencies, but the very liquid currencies. Um, they trade about $5 trillion a day. This is 2016 numbers because the BIS only published that every two years, three years. So they are going to have one in April 2019. Should have done this work, but haven't published it yet. But they only publish this every three years. But anyway, $5 trillion is a lot of money. So I want to figure with you guys to figure out how much of that trading could be fundamental, could be trading because people really need to ch exchange foreign exchange. So I'm going to give you two numbers. That's the ones that make my students come out from first principle, is how much world annual trade of volume of goods and services. Okay? That's 20 trillion USD. That's annual per year, the 20 trillion USD. To come up with this number, what I tell my undergraduates for, for, do the following. They have to know the GDP of the US, you multiply that by four, and you should know that the share of trading of the typical economy is something between 25 and 30%, and you get a number, 20 trillion, but I'm not putting you through that exercise. That's the other one, capital flows. That's a little harder to do it by head, although you could come up with some numbers. The capital flows are less than 25 trillion a year. Okay, so you add that up, you figure out that trading for 20 days cover annual exports 
plus annual capital flows, even if every transaction goes to a third currency. So suppose you, you're, 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 you're a Euro person, you need to export, to import from Japan, you have to deliver yen. It is possible, that depends, you don't have to, there's a fairly liquid Euro yen market, but you could say, well, I'm going to trade through the dollar because my bank only does dollars and the other bank is going to, so you multiply, that's why I say going through a third currency, just to give it a big chance, okay? But then you get 20 days of FX trading. So what are people doing the other 230 days? Which is, so less than 10% you can explain with that, okay? Now, that's not a phenomenon just of, so to try to explain that by liquidity, liquidity shocks is ludicrous. You know, you have, what are the liquidity shocks you need for people? You know, I've never, I've experimented liquidity shock in the sense that I need a hundred bucks. That's like a big liquidity shock, right? So people don't get liquidity shocks all the time. Um, so, it is very common, uh, I mean, you, you have, you have a, a, um, this puzzle in a lot of other markets. New York Stock Exchange annual turnover is about a hundred, the typical stock turns over a hundred percent, the median stock. Uh, the same thing is true for Japanese stocks. Uh, in China, of course, they trade 250 percent because the Chinese like to trade or whatever, you know. Or maybe they get more liquidity shocks than the other people. I have no idea. But the, the whole theory about trade, trying to explain trading just... So the only, I think, credible thing from my point of view is difference in beliefs. You really have to believe. Now, that's another thing. You know, I was told when I was, you know, 20 something zero, just, uh, you know, that, or even before when I was in graduate school still, I was, I was told that those things, different beliefs cannot persist. You cannot agree to disagree. And a lot of the work came from this building, so I'm a little nervous about talking like this in this building, but that's the fact that that's, that's uh, where we have to go. So I'm going to go to difference of beliefs. Now, this idea is kind of old. Um, I don't know how much time I have to, to take care of, of, of the Miller paper. So the Miller paper, this is not the famous Miller. It's not Merton Miller. It's a Miller that, as far as I know, wrote one paper. I mean, I only know one of his papers. You know his first name, Daryl? Edwin. Edwin Miller. Do you know other papers by Edwin Miller? There is one other. One other. So you see, I know 50% of the guys who work. <laughs> Daryl knows 100%. All right, that's good. So, so here's Miller in, 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 in 1977. He had, I think, a very nice idea. He said, look, let's take the usual trading model that people do, uh, the simplest one. The simplest one is where investors have normal beliefs with the mean and a variance about the value of a stock. Maybe they all have the same variance, but they can diverge about what they think is the mean of the, of the distribution of the payoffs. Okay, but then I'm going to take this payoff, this means uniformly distributing some interval. So they have an average value of mu, but they can go from mu minus kappa to mu plus kappa. So you think of, of a uniform distribution of, of mean returns, mean, mean prices, those are prices, they're not returns, they're prices. The interest rate is zero, per capita supply of the risky asset is Q. Now we can solve this model very simply for these exponential utilities and you're going to use one trick, I'm not going to do it for you, some of you can learn it in Darrow's book and a lot of other places, with Kyle's thesis and so on, is that if you take a normally distributed random variable, okay, with mu, mu y, and variance sigma y square, and you want to compute the expected value of e to the y, okay, what you get is e to the power mu of y, which is like the, the mean, plus square, the variance divided by two. Okay, so that's a typical trick. And with this trick, you can solve this problem. Then it becomes a simple linear problem. Sure. No, I did not have risk aversion there. Once. Yes. Yeah, for resharing purposes. Yes. So those guys trading, that's the question. I mean, that's another reason for t having trading. In the arrow Dubrow model, you trade once. In an arrow model, you could trade, you could trade repeat. So then getting back to our number here, you have to believe that people who are trading FX are trading for risk aversion reasons. Now, there's an interesting paper by Fisher Black, which I'm sure Daryl knows, about why Americans should hold yen. So even though uh, 
you think that risk aversion will let people say, oh, I, have a, I, I live in the United States, I have a yen-denominated income, I should hold, transform that into dollars. That would be like the risk aversion kind of thing. It actually, sometimes it works the other way around. That's the, because of the convexity of the payoff of 1 over x. Okay. So maybe you should hold a little bit of yen for your, do you hold yens? Okay. <laughs> That's for sure, but I could tell you. Uh, I can think of very little of my income, which is, I mean, indirectly, perhaps, through my portfolio of stocks and so on, but I can't even figure out what they would be. Maybe Daryl knows his yen exposure of your, of your stock portfolio. <laughs> Most people have no idea. But it's, it's, uh, it's true. They have risk aversion. Okay, this is what I have risk aversion, by the way. Huh? Yes, but what would they be if they are institutions, exactly they make me money, they make me, institutions will be the ones that will either be uh, importing or exporting. Most of that are institutions, right? Imports, exports. Huh? Anyhow. Anyhow. Yeah. Okay. Um, by the way, this is a little bit of an insider story because I've traded, f there was a time in my life where as a part of a hedge fund, we traded currencies. So I know a little bit about the currency market. And, and the only reason I traded currencies was because I thought the market, my view, I had a different expected return than the market. Otherwise, why would I do that? I would stay home and sleep, you know, instead of losing my sleep at, no, at night, worried that something would happen in Japan while I had a long yen position or short yen position, doesn't matter, which, I've, which happened many times in my life. So, I mean, during that period. So trading is not as inexpensive as people think. So anyway, so you get from that, you get the demand for the, for, for the asset. The demand of the asset is proportional to what you think is individual I, the return will be, minus the price, and then weighted by, inversely weighted by the product of your risk aversion and your volatility, okay? And the, and the, and the variance, I'm sorry, and the variance. But that tells you that in a the, in the homogeneous world, you really don't care because the price is only going to reflect the average mu i, right? Because you're going to average out all these x i's to be zero. You have to average out all these mu i's minus p naught to be zero. And that tells you what the thing, and of course, the total demand, I'm not, I'm sorry. The sum of the x i's has to be q, and you're going to average those things to give q, and, but that's the mu. All right. Now, if you had short sales, some people are going to take negative positions. People who are very pessimistic are going to want to take a negative position. But if you have short sale constraints, those people cannot take a negative position. And what Miller noticed is that in that case, you can solve that problem just like just algebra and figure out, to, uh, figure out one thing, that if people disagree by enough, under short sale constraint, the optimists are going to carry a big position the pessimists are going to be at zero, okay? Uh, and then they would, in the, in the, I'm sorry, in the, without the constraints, you have the optimists taking a big positive position, the, 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 the most pessimists taking a big negative position. But when you forbid the pessimists to take positions, then the price has to rise so that the optimists uh, um, uh, are satisfied without, without uh, the, the, the negative demand from the, from the pessimist. So as a result, you get a too high a price. So this observation that prices were, are high when you have short sale constraints date from 1977, the paper by Miller. Okay. By the way, I have an exercise here which is kind of interesting. You can allow people to short, but just have a penalty on how much you get when you short and you get the same result. So. We can discuss this. There is a, I think there's a, there's a paper which I'll cite tomorrow when we talk about, you won't be here. But there's a paper by Brudemeyer, et cetera. Yeah. Brudemeyer is one of the authors. Simsek is another one, and Wei Shang is the third author, who kind of considers that problem. Okay, so in general, you know, people think whether sh people should be allowed to take bets or not. And the proposal by Glenn Weil 
was my former student, but also Eric's former student, uh, is that you should ban this because these things ca can only diminish utility in some sense. So, you know, you have to think of what you're trying to achieve because ex ante, those people are, if you forbid them to do something, they're going to have lower utility. So, the, the paper by Brunmeier, Simsek, and, and Chong, which, which will appear tomorrow, it's in here. By the way, this ends with a bunch of references. My reference is all here, so when you get the slides, you're going to get a bunch of references. This paper will be on the reference list. Try to think of that from a criteria of Pareto optimality, a, a modified criteria of Pareto optimality, which I mention next tomorrow. But it's an interesting thing. Okay, now there's of course a lot of evidence that shorting is costly. I don't think uh, Darrow has written on this several papers. There's a lot of empirical evidence on that, uh, um, and you know there's this paper by Davolio, that this this paper by by Dieter and co-authors, so can tell you that there's a lot of us, there's a lot of um, the fact that shorting is costly seems to be very evident from the data. Now, <coughs> so when I talk about difference in beliefs, uh, in the models we will discuss, agents disagree about the model or about some of the model parameters. I'm not going to make that distinction. Whether they di is, that distinction is actually not a very useful distinction because disagreeing about the model is the same thing as disagreeing about model parameters if you allow me infinite dimensional pro number of uh, vector parameters which is infinite dimensional. So I don't really see how you can change those things. Uh, and they also they do not learn from each other's behavior. So that's a big no-no, but they won't learn anything. The idea that why the reason I motivate this empirically is that most bubbles, most of the episodes I'm interested in are fairly short. Okay, bubbles don't last forever. There are exceptions. That some bubbles have lasted for a long time. But most bubbles are fairly short phenomena. I think for a long time you have to start thinking about how people learn and so on. I'll talk about this, uh, what happens. Now, often I'll be talking about the reason they disagree because they have overconfidence. They exaggerate the precision of their beliefs. This is not going to play any role here, but plays a role in the papers. Okay? And there is one evidence for overconfidence, which I like a lot to cite. I mean, it's, I'm sure you and Ma will mention the same data when she gives her lectures. And that's the idea that um, there's been, uh, Duke University have polled for, for, since between 2001 and 2010, I think there are revisions of this data now, but by when this paper was written, there were about nine, 10 years of polling by Duke University about a thousand plus senior finance executives in U.S. corporation, asking for a very, very uh, asking for the following question: Tell me what do you think is the 1090 interval for the S&P next year? Okay, that's a pretty simple way. So you want to give two numbers: one that tells you that it has less than a 10 percent chance that you're going to be the S&P is going to be below that number, and one there is less than a 10 percent chance that the S&P will be above that number. Now. Again, I want to test you guys. What do you think, how, what should be the amplitude of that interval? First of all, where should that interval be centered? What's the expected return in the S&P? Huh? No, higher. Huh? Eight. I can't really tell you, but it's like 6% is the risk premium, right? Of the S&P. So assuming that so you have to add to that tra the average treasury rate for that period. So what, another 3%? Two now. Uh, it's two now, but for the period where they measure, oh, yeah. something like 9% or 8 or 9%. Okay, that's the average, okay? What's the standard deviation of the S&P, annual de standard deviation of the S&P? Uh, 20 is a good number, 18, 20, some number like that. I'll take 20 because it's a good number to work with. Although 18 is going to turn out to be a little bit easier to do, but 20, 20 is fine. 20. What is the 1090 interval in terms of standard deviations? What is 10 and 90 is the same. It's the same number of standard deviation. That's right. Very symmetric, right? So what should be the standard deviation that gives you to 10 or to 90? Guys, you, know, you never look at a normal table. I've looked at many times, I didn't remember either. It's like 1.3. So that's 1.3 standard deviations up, you get to 90, 1.3 standard deviation down, you get to 90. 
So you can think about what this guy should answer. They should answer the following. You multiply 1.3 by 20. Now you guys have to get, you get what? 26, right? So you have to add to 8 to take Darrow's number, plus or minus 26. Now, if somebody asks you that question, you look like an idiot about the S&P, right? If you're 10, the question is that S&P has a lot of volatility relative to the mean return, you know? It's, a, it's a, what a uh, finance guy would say has a sharp of one-third. It's a low sharp. If you're a hedge fund, you propose somebody uh, a strategy that has a sharp of one-third, they send you home. In my simulation, telling me I have a sharp of one-third, they say, well, I don't want to invest with you. Nonetheless, people invest on the S&P, and that's a one-third sharp, okay? So, which means that you get, it's a very large interval. But now, what people answer, of course, they answer much, much tighter intervals. Everybody answers much tighter, because they, either they think they know, or they want to think, or they want the other people to think they know something, though they respond much sharper intervals. To a point, there are only a third of these intervals that those guys announced. So at the end of the year, you can take all the intervals announced and see what, how many of them, how many of them had the actual change of the S&P within them. And that's about a third. Only a third of the intervals actually capture the actual returns. Okay? Whereas the 1090 interval, how much did you get? Come on, guys. Wake up after lunch. <laughs> how much did you get on the 1090 interval? 80%. Right? You get 80%, but you get a third. I don't know that. I have, we have to ask. Maybe you ran who know the answer. She knows all this data. She knows every number in that table. So she probably knows that, too. All right. So I'm going to start. Before we go on, I want to start saying how do you motivate the, how do you motivate a model of bubbles? And I'm going to motivate it by making some stylized, mentioning some stylized facts. Now, you don't have to believe me about the stylized facts, although I suspect I was, I'm sure that other people have noticed similar things, but I'll give you a lot of examples, okay? So, first of all, something that was mentioned yesterday. Who mentioned this yesterday? Somebody mentioned, uh, Nobu mentioned this. That bubbles appear in times of technological financial innovation. You're talking about finan technological financial innovation. This, you know, I'll, I'll argue about that. I think those are good times to have difference of opinions because nobody really knows about what's going on. The second is that bubbles are accomplished by increasing trading volume. You think this FX trading is a lot. If you were to look at periods in which there was a lot of uh, certain periods, you see some currencies at very high price at the same time, people really focus on trading on those currencies. The Australian dollar is an, is an example of certain periods. Okay? Now, now um, there's a lot of evidence for that. The first, the one paper which is very interesting is this paper by Carlos and co-authors. Those are historians. And look at the South Sea bubble. i tell you a little bit about the South Sea bubble because it's a very interesting bubble. The South Sea bubble was a bubble that lasted eight months. It's very short. It was a company called the South Sea Company, and the South Sea Company was, you know, the British Parliament at that time looked a lot like my own country's parliament. You know, there was a lot of corruption. Okay? So what happened, there was a big dispute about who's going to have, somebody had a brilliant idea, which perhaps was the first massive idea of financial engineering. The British government, as you know, the British Crown, has issued that for a long, long time, had issued that for a long, long time. Even in 1720, they had issued that for a long, long time. It was the only country that had issued that and actually paid them. Okay. So there's a lot of issues hanging around. It's a very funny issue. Some issues, there are a lot of perpetual bonds, so they had no, no principle. They only pay a coupon all the time. Uh, others had clauses depending on the death of certain public figures. There's a lot of all kinds of bonds. And one of the problems with these bonds is some of them by design, you could not, you could not redeem. Okay? You could not sell. You could not sell. They were not redeemable in Egypt, but you could not sell. And others, uh, they were so illiquid that you couldn't sell them anyway. So somebody had a brilliant financial engineering idea. He said, look, I'm going to form a company. I'm going to fund this company. You, the way you're going to get shares of this company is giving me crown debt. Okay? So now I have all this crown debt in my treasure. I'm going to get this interest. 
and I'm going to use the interest to pay dividends. You're going to get a single piece of paper. Everybody, all the different bonds are going to get the same paper. You can, then can go ahead and trade it. That was the South Sea Company. Now, they were not the only ones who had this idea. The Bank of England had a similar idea. The Bank of England was then a private company. And there was a very big fight in Parliament. They purchased, all of them purchased different parts of Parliament, but eventually the South Sea Company won. And the consolation prize for the Bank of England is they were given the right to do that, but only to issue very small denomination bills. So that's when the Bank of England got into the, into the, into the business of issuing bills, by that time a private company. So the South Sea Company got this monopoly. Okay? Now, as always, there's always a story. This was the real thing the South Sea Company was doing, financial engineering. There's also a story that they said, we have a monopoly of trade with the with South America. Now South America at that time was understood to be everything until Mexico. So they had a monopoly of trade in South America. But in their monopoly of trade in South America was worth very little because there has been a secession war in, in Spain. Britain had taken the wrong side and they were not very in very good speaking terms between Spanish crown and this is all Spanish colonies. So they didn't get much out of that. Historians know that they did very little trade eventually. But they were very good at financial engineering. So I'm going to talk more about that, but this, this increase in trading volume was observed by these historians. Um, it was observed by Hong and Stein on the, on the run-up to the, uh, that when they analyzed the run-up to the crash of 1930, and the paper by Lamont and Thaler on the internet bubble, there's a lot of those, those things that happen, okay? And the third one, which I think the most interesting fact, and I'm going to concentrate tomorrow, talk about a lot on that, um, is that and in some way, the art story is the reverse of that. The art story I'm going to tell is going to be connected with that too. Is that bubble implosions coincide with the increase in asset supply. So during the South Sea bubble, it was very interesting. When people saw the success of the South Sea company on this financial engineering game, so there was so much interest in trading that I should start a company. Now, we don't have, we have pretty good contemporary records. The nice thing about the UK is that they had business history already, just a little bit after the South Sea bubble, they already have business historians. So there's pretty good accounts of what happened. Although some of those accounts are a little bit hard to believe on. Okay. So, um, but what we saw, there was a doubling of the outstanding share of the South Sea Company. The South Sea Company kept issuing more and more shares. The Bank of England, of course, issued more shares. All those things could look like the South Sea Company. But they had these numerous other joint share companies that appeared. And when you read the description of the, of the joint share companies, it's very funny their purpose. You know that some of them had to be total fraud. So uh, the most funny for me is one that promised to produce cannons capable of shooting square balls. Now, now how could they sell shares or something like this? But apparently they could. Okay? And so the South Sea Company got very worried. And after all, they had already bribed Parliament to get their, 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 their monopoly. So then they bribed parliament again to pass essentially a law saying you cannot create a company without a royal charter. Of course, parliament controlled the royal charter. And then second, you could not change the business purpose of your company without a change in your official change in your royal charter. Which then was to deal with companies who decided, you know, I am, making stuff. There's a company that still exists in name at least called the Wilkinson Sword Company that still exists. But Wilkinson Sword Company uh, decided to become, uh, to sell shares and, and buy debt, other debt and so on. So that's what was going on. So wait, how does thing change? Oh, it's here. Okay, so I'm going back, right? Trying to see how this thing works. OK. OK. Now, during the internet, there's also work showing that there was a big increase just before the crash of the internet. There was a huge increase on shares. And the reason it worked is because somebody mentioned this before. Many of the internet companies would go public with a very small percentage of shares. But there would be a lockup expiration, typically six months afterwards. So there was a lot of companies had gone public in 2000, uh, in 1999, 
And there was an extraordinary number of Lockhart explorations in the first half of 2000. There's a paper by Arthur and Richardson on this. Yeah. Yes. So typically when those companies went public, they sold a small percentage of the company. Most of the shares were just delivered to either the in initial investors, which typically were venture capital funds or rich individuals and so on, or and to workers at the company, you know, people that had found working, been working in the company. So these shares could not, they had, they could not trade them for a certain amount of time. That was called the lockup. And typically they were, in, the typical lockup was six months. It's not, there's no law about the lockup period and so on. Almost every public public IPO has a lockup period. Right? Yeah. So it's a matter of contract, though, not law. It's a matter of contract, they just said. It's a matter of contract, not law. But uh, they all had it. So the last one I want to do is be a lot of the stuff tomorrow, but I want to go through it today just to, to tell you why we're interested in shorting. Okay? So if you read the book by Michael Lewis, which I make all my undergraduates read, or you can watch, the you can cheat and watch the movie. Uh, but this is something you got, or everybody should do. In the book by M Michael Lewis, um, he describes this p how people got, how the change of, how there were all these pessimists out there wanted to short the star, wanted to short CDOs, but they couldn't do it. And so how they went through a lobbying process to convince the regulators or the self-regulating entities in many cases to allow them to do it. Okay. So there was something that has been called by many people the CDO machine. What was the idea of the CDO machine for those of you who are not US uh, students? The CDO machine was to transform home equity bonds, that is bonds based on mortgages, okay, that were based on less than prime mortgages, so they had low ratings. You want to make them triple A stuff, okay? And there's no, nothing like a bunch of economists to be able to do this kind of magic, okay? So how do you do this magic? First, you have to make the right assumptions. The right assumptions, take a bunch of bonds and assume they have, they, they have zero correlation or very low correlation among themselves. And then you know the magic, you know, by taking portfolios of them, now the risk really goes down, right? Per dollar really goes down. So that's the first thing. Well, but that wasn't really enough. You did this correlation assumption that works some. Then you do the next, which is trenching. You said, okay, we we'll have this bonds. They have a face value of 100. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to sell a security that is going to pay the first 20 or the first 50, whatever, you know, the first X dollars. Okay, so the first out of 100 million, the first 50 million go to there if he buys the security. Now there he's thinking, look, this stuff is not really a triple A, it's not great yet, but I'm going to get the first payoff. The rest is going to be in Elhanan's hands. He's going to be holding this junk part. He's probably going to have a much lower payment, but I'm buying a very good security. Okay? So they do that. Now poor Elhanan has that stuff. Elhanan tells me, I am the banker. Okay, I'm the the guy doing the security. So I go to Alhanan and Alhanan says, Daryl says, great, the stuff I want to buy, give him a little bit of, of interest over treasury, and I'll be happily, happy to hold it. Okay, that's, I got rid of this 50. Now I have another 50, so what do I do? Alhanan tells him, I don't want this stuff, it's really too risky. So I take another 100, take the first 50 and give it to Eric, who is, you know, wants a safe thing, and now I tell Alhanan, look, I take 50 from here, 50 from that. Remember, diversification, correlations. And I'm going to send you a trench of 50 of that. And Elhanan said, oh, that looks much better. That's triple A. I'll pay interest so Elhanan is happy. Now, out of 200, I'm only left with 50. The 50 is pretty bad, but it doesn't matter. I take another, another 200, do the same magic again, take the last 50, combine them, I sell another 50, okay, and keep going on. So, with this thing, Almost every, you know, there's a paper that I'm, uh, is in my reading list by Cordell and Cawthon who showed that almost every CDO trench was actually sold to consumers, okay, didn't stay at the hands of the initiator, or sold to final buyers, consumer, to final buyers, could be institutions, whatever, to final buyers. They actually were sold, had AAA ratings. Okay, so that was the magic, okay. So, you, you, all of a sudden, you create this enormous amount of triple A paper. Now, what those guys did, and I'll describe the story better to, uh, tomorrow, they created tools to short. So what were the tools they created? 
First, a standardized credit default swap. Did you mention credit default swap? Do you guys know what a credit default swap is? So normal credit default swap is on a bond. You have a bond of a corporation that pay, is supposed to pay 100 six months from now, whatever, a year from now. And a credit default swap is a contract I signed with someone who tells, tells them the following. If this company doesn't pay me, I'll give you a bond and you give me the full amount. Now, first, for that contract, I have to pay a fee. Okay. But now, for an MBS, it's complicated because an MBS, a mortgage backed security, is a collection of mortgages. So there is no, there's no date of payment. There's different coupons that are paid. So they can design a security. They basically get people to receive the money as a function of how many, many defaults there were. And then eventually, they created also CDS or CDO tranches. Now, notice how late that happened. That happened in the summer of 2006. That's pretty late because everything broke in the spring of 2007. So that's a year, be uh, less than a year before the end. Nonetheless, synthetic CDOs using CDS as collateral, mostly issued since they started issue a little before they got the thing really regulated in 2006, more than doubled the amount of triple B bonds that had been initially been part of the home equity bond. So if you took all the ho triple B home equity bonds, okay, you created as many new home equity bonds through the synthetic CDOs, um, more than double all the CDOs that had been created in the period 1998-2007. So nine years of people working this financial engineering I told you about, finding the Darrows and the Alhanas who believe in those correlation assumptions and so on, those guys created the same amount in less than a year. Okay. Now, one example which is very famous, do you guys know about Abacus 2007 AC1? So that's the, that was the synthetic CDO created by Goldman Sachs and was the one who resulted on an SEC enforcement action against them. So the SEC said, you cheated here. You created something which was much worse than it was apparent, had all these people uh, uh, buy it. And, uh, but it's interesting. The total amount of CDSs there were two billion. Now, every CDS has to have a reference bond. So what these guys did, sometimes he refers a synthetic CDO, uh, a, a CDO trench, then it refers to a bond. So the people, this Cordell and others, they did the work of tracing back all the bonds that supported that, okay, whose default would cost payments. And the original cash value of all the bonds was 1.2 billion. So for that particular case, they charged, they, they shorted one and a half times the total outstanding. That was the beauty of it. I mean, when a stock is shorted 5%, people start noting. One and a half times, I don't think it ever happens with the stock, right? Do you know cases? or? stock which was short at one and a half times it, yeah but that means it's very rare it's very rare and that's true of every one of those okay that's just an example okay so now I'm going to go into a model um, I'm going to talk a little very fast about this model by Harrison and Krabs, um, and and what Yue Shong and I did with it. But the idea, the basic idea is Harrison Krebs 78, that's the paper which is cited there. They were not interested in bubbles, things like that. So the, the papers, but the, but the basic idea of having disagreement and short sale constraints comes from here. Okay. Now, what I did with Wei Shong is that we thought about risk neutral investors that were in two groups. All investors discount the future payoffs continuously in continually compounded way at that at a rate r greater than zero. So it's like some of the examples that Peter talked about, where you have some kind of machine to, to, to store your money if you need to. There's a single risky asset in fixed supply that's going to provide a, a flow of dividends. And you have an observable flow of dividends. And you observe the flow of dividends. There's a little bit of, a, of math here, that, but I, I want to just say what it is. And you don't have to follow all the details, which is like this. The, Cumulative dividends or the, the total dividend, okay, they change at a, a, according to a diffusion, so they have a drift and they have a volatility. 
Now, in this model, in this version of the model, everybody agrees about the volatility of the, of the, of the change in dividends, but the drift, they disagree about the drift. Okay, the C means it's for each type. C can be A or B. Now, they all know that they all know what the other type thinks. So think about having two groups, this half of this room and that half of the room. So this half of the room has an idea, this half of the room has an idea that dividends are being increased at a certain rate, an average, a certain rate, let's suppose you're the optimist, is going to increase it. 2% a year, 10% a year, and those guys here are pessimists. They think dividends are going to shrink at 1% a year, whatever. Now, that's everybody knows. What they also know is that each one of them, the people that think 10% and the people that think 1%, think there's some kind of normal value for the dividend, which is F bar, which they both agree, normal rate of growth F bar, and they think that that's going to mean revert according to a rate lambda. Of course, lambda could be zero, which means there's no mean reversion, but you could have mean reversion. And, but there's also volatility on that, on that, uh, on those, on the change in the drift. So there is uncertainty about tomorrow's dividends or next season dividend, but also there's uncertainty about next instance drift, where the drift is going to be next instance. So those are the two things they, they, they go. So the only thing which is really they are disagreeing, they all know about each other models, but they disagree about the current drift. Okay, that's what they really disagree. And the rest, they, disagree, they know they have different models. Okay, so say somebody has a, I think it has a higher dividend today. If A thinks a higher dividend than B, I'll say A are the optimists and B are the pessimists. They're just words. Okay. And now, the other thing is that they agree to disagree, and they all think that their difference in beliefs is going to mean revert according to a rate rho and with a certain volatility. Okay, so difference beliefs are today, they tend to mean revert, but that's going to be. So invest in one group, know the model used by, other, by the other group, and agree to disagree. Henry Blodgett, you guys are too young to know who Henry Blodgett is, but there was a time that Darren and I knew who the guy was. I never met Henry Blodgett. Have you met him? Never met him. Never met him. He was very famous because he was the guy who was the big tech enthusiast during the tech bubble. Okay, everything was going to go up by a lot. And he said something after the implosion. said, we all have the same information. You're just making different conclusions about what the future will hold. So that's what this model is about. It's a model of Harry Blodgett. Okay? He agrees. They, he didn't know anything special, but he was good at telling the future with the same information. Okay. So we have a model. With Shonga, I have a model where we talk about the, the people who have different beliefs or certain signals, but that's not so important for us today. Now, how trading occurs, and this is very important, when you trade, you have to pay a fee. And I'll see, you can see why this fee should be positive to make things. We're going to have a finite supply of the, agent, of the asset. We're going to have a large number of agents. So the buyers always pay her reservation price. It's competition about buyers. So when the optimists are trying to buy something, there are so many of you guys that you're going to have to pay your reservation price. Okay? That's, that's the... That's the that's to make math simple. You can, make, you can do splitting the surplus in any way you want. I'm going to give all the surplus to the seller. Okay. So, it's an equation. What does it say? That's an important thing. When, how much am I willing to pay? Well, I'm an optimist today. I'm thinking about buying the asset. Okay. The two things that, that come to my mind. The first is that I think that in the future, I'm going to get a dividend. And this... I know the drift, I know how the drift is expected to change, so I can, I can figure out what the average dividend I should get. Okay. But there's another event which can be very important. Remember that our difference of opinions are fluctuating. I'm an optimist right now, a relative optimist. But in the future, okay, something could go on and Noble could go crazy. You could say, oh, I think Noble and all his friends, everybody sitting here, right? Noble and all his friends could go crazy and they would say, well, this stuff is worth a lot, more than what you'd think at that moment. So what would you do at that point? If the difference is large enough, you may want to sell it to, to Noble and, and his friends. And they are going to pay their reservation price, which at that point will be higher than yours. Okay? So that's what this equation says. It's a stopping time problem. As the, I think Daryl mentioned that yesterday. It's a stopping time problem. I have to decide that in the future I may want to sell it 
But when I'm going to sell it, well, when Nobu goes really crazy, sufficiently crazy, that's enough for me to, to give up the, the option to sell, it to, uh, to sell it in the future. Because if I sell the asset, I no longer hold it. I don't have the option to sell it in the future anymore. So to solve a problem like this, you want to find an equilibrium price. As always in this stuff, you have to have a smart guess. And the smart guess here is pretty simple. You say, look, there should be two variables that I should look at. You guys are buying now because you're optimists. You think about two things. How much you're going to get, right? That's your future dividend. And how much you could sell it for in different states of the world. But that should be a function of how much Nobu thinks now. Because everything else is just a realization of uncertainty. So Nobu thinks now, you think it's worth 10. But Nobu thinks it's only 2. You're going to say, it's going to take a long time for Nobu to think it's worth more than me. Because, you know, I may drift down, he may drift up. But on average, it's going to take a long time. But you have think it's 10 and Nobu thinks it's 9, then you're saying, well, it's very likely that Nobu is going to come pretty soon because now the difference is small. There's a bigger chance of Nobu all of a sudden wanting it much more than me. So that's what says what the guess is. The guess is that you have an initial price, which is just some of your expected dividends, plus a function of the difference of opinions. Okay? And that function. You are the optimist, you're looking at noble minus yours. That's what you're looking at. That's now a negative number because you're, but your func that function should increase with, with as that difference is going to, as that negative number becomes less negative. Okay. okay. So the price can be described, the price is no receipt that allowed plus a value of the option to resell. And in this literature, this value of the option to resell is what you equate as a bubble. So you can now try to figure out how much you're going to be willing to pay. Now you give this function to yourself. You give the function to Nobu, the symmetric function, because he cares about the difference of opinion. You minus them, minus him. And you care about him minus you. But it's just, just a matter of symmetry. So you have a function, the same function for Nobu. And now you can figure out how much you're going to, you're going to sell. You can separate you know, you expect a profit, and eventually you're going to sell when Nobu is willing to pay enough. And how much Nobu is going to be willing to pay? Well, first of all, he's going to pay about his difference of opinions in the future, because that's what he cares for. The vi I mean, sorry, if you trade, when you trade, I, I was saying something that was not correct. Let me go back. When you trade, what, what is the gain from trade here? Okay, that's what you concentrate. So this is your valuation, if you have it forever. But when you trade, what's, it's just like what Darrow was doing yet. What is the gain from trade? You have to figure out what's the difference between what Nobu is willing to pay at that moment and you in your reservation price. And when you do that, you think, well, I have to think, first of all, of the difference of opinions because it's going to go from you to Nobu. Right? So the difference of opinion is going to pay a low divided by the discounting, which is both the rate of interest and the convergence of opinions. Right? the convergence of the Fs, plus an option that depends on Nobu's, diff the, what Nobu looks like at. Nobu looks at your opinion minus his. You look at Nobu's opinions minus yours. Nobu looks at yours minus his, because it's, everything is symmetric. Okay? But you also have to pay the cost of trading, and you choose the time that gives you the biggest value. And that's the equilibrium model you're going to solve. And with a little bit of algebra, it's just pure algebra, you get to a very interesting problem. You say that the value of the option for you guys should be the supreme of all stopping times of the expected value of this function on the right-hand side. The function on the right-hand side, those are the gains from trade, just from the dividends. That's what nobody is willing to pay, the Q that nobody is willing to pay, minus the cost. Yes, you take into account, remember the, your F, you know, look at this equation here. You know that F, your, whole, your view of the drift, you know that the drift, you see a high drift today, doesn't mean that you expect the high drift to stay high forever. 
you know they tends to mean reverse. Everything works with lambda equal to zero. So you could think of the case where you think, I know that my expected drift tomorrow is my drift today. That's okay. Or you can think, I know my expected drift tomorrow is my drift today minus a certain loss of drift. Okay. So now you have a problem that's kind of interesting because that's an option. It's just like an American option, if you've seen American options. The only difference is that on the right-hand side of an American option is an exogenous exercise gain. Here on the right-hand side of the American option is an ex exercise gain which is a function of some other variable, but it's the same function as it enters here. So it's like an equilibrium option problem. It's like an option problem has an equilibrium feature. Because the exercise value depends on how much you how much that option will be valued in the equilibrium. Okay. So that's what makes it a, a more interesting mathematical problem. Then, but it's an American option exercise value linked to the value of the option. I want to give at most more five minutes to the thing. And as an American option, I don't know how many how many of you guys saw American options. How many of you guys have seen American options? You have there. Oh, I'm surprised. You know, I learned from your book. I'm surprised you've seen it. <laughs> Who else? Okay, some of the people have seen it. So an, Ameri so an American option is an option that where you have the right, but not the obligation. In this case, to sell something. That's what you have. It could be buy or sell, right? Um, to sell something, um, but you don't have a specific time like in a usual. European option. You can hold it, you can sell it for whatever, you can sell it whenever you want. Usually there's an expiration date. This is an infinitely lived American option. You can hold it forever. At any point in time, you can sell it. Okay? And an American option, you get two equations about it. And those equations say the following. You can say in words. Okay? First of all, the value of an option has to be always greater and equal than what you get when you exercise. Because you can always exercise an option every moment. That's the first equation here. Given the different opinions x, the value of the option should be the same thing as the, 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 what you get if you exercise. This is what no would pay today. And you can always not exercise. But while you're not exercising, take into account the discount factor. The value of the option should be a martingale. Okay? So there's a cost of money that you have to account to. That's why you have this term RQ. So think of when you get this equal to zero. So RQ is here, but this thing here just tells us that's a martingale. That's Ito's lemma. Okay? So that's what you're doing. So the guess for an American option is the following. You're going to stop. You're going to sell. You guys are going to sell. Once Noble values the asset sufficiently more than you, there'll be a, a number K star. And if he's below that, you don't sell it. And you never let it go above that. Maybe when it starts, the first moment is above that. Th then you just sell it to Noble. Okay. And it turns out that if, even though this problem generates an equation, which is not an equation I had seen before, that's the advantage of having a physicist for a co-author, Wei Shang. When he looks at this equation, he says, this looks a lot like something called a Kummer equation that physicists use. It's and there's a whole thing in mathematics called Kummer functions. You don't have to know that, or you can look it up. Uh, but it turns out that after changing, f clever change of variable, it was the Kummer, Kummer equation. So we got our Kummer functions. So we could solve it. And what's important when you solve a problem like this, you can actually fully characterize, you can fully characterize this kind of a boundary, okay? And you can show that this is actually an equilibrium option value function, which in the sense, remember, it has to be an equilibrium option value function. The value of the option today depends on the value of the option in the future, right? So you have to, the exercise price depends on the value of the option in the future. And what the optimal policy is, is that, you know, once the difference of opinion gets big enough, you sell to the other party, which makes a lot of sense. Okay. And then you can prove a lot of interesting compare statics results. Tomorrow we talk about some of the things in, in different contexts. The Q is convex in the difference of opinion. And that means that the more volatility of the difference of opinion is the higher the value of the option. Right? That's second order stochastic dominance stuff. So when you have more difference of opinions, the option is valued more. More volatility in the other difference of opinions, uh, the option is more. 
it decreases with the cost of, ex of selling, of course. It decreases the interest rate. That's kind of obvious, the higher the interest rate. But you know, there's a big discussion in bubbles how much governments should change the interest rate, how much central banks should change the interest rate. If your problem is, in fact, you want to lower the value of the bubble, that's a pretty good instrument in this case, although it affects a lot of other stuff, which may not be so good. And the exercise boundary you can get, uh, compare statics. And you define the bubble as the difference between the owner's demand price and he, what he would pay if retrading was not allowed. So the bubble is, is what's gotten from speculation. So in this literature, bubble is the same thing as speculation. It's the value of speculation. If I buy something just to hold it forever, that's one price. If I buy something but, allow my, but I'm allowed to retrade and I give it a higher value, it's because I want to speculate. Because remember, those people are risk neutral. You don't have any need to, to risk share. Okay. There's a trade friction C. So it's a net. Oh, there's no difficulty. Yeah, it's a centralized market. It's a centralized market. Well, I don't know what you call a zero-sum game, because remember, we have different beliefs. This is something part of what Eric asked, or who else asked. No, you did. Darrow asked. We have different beliefs, so gaining just from betting. In your opinion, but he may think he's also gaining. You can win, win under your expectation, and, he, and there are, I can win under my expectations, and Daryl can win under his expectations. The modeler has a third set of expectations. So that's the part of what's discussed in Brunmeier, Chong, and Simpson. Simpson and Chong. Okay. Um, so anyway, I'll talk more about the stuff tomorrow, but um, there's one result which I think is kind of interesting. Okay, what happens is you take the cost to zero. Now, as you take the cost to zero in a model like this, it's something that Darrow explained in his book, you get local time. So if the cost is truly zero, you should get an infinite amount of trades in any interval. Provided you got a trade, you're going to get an infinite amount of trades. Okay, that's the local time effect of Brownian Bush. That's just math. It doesn't have any specific economics to it. But it means that if you don't, if you don't trade, if the trading is costless, you're going to trade a lot. Provided you trade a little bit, you trade an infinite amount in any finite interval, OK? So, but nonetheless, you can take the limit as c goes to 0. And you get, a, you get a, an exercise boundary which is non-trivial. That's what's kind of interesting. You get an exercise boundary which is non-trivial. It's non-trivial in the following sense. It's proportional to volatility. Of course, it's going to go to 0 because cubic root of c also goes to 0. But you know its behavior. It's going like the cubic root of c. Now, once you know that result, you know the following. The median number of times you're going to have trades, okay, is going to be the elasticity of the median time of trade. This is something you have to work out the math, but it's not very hard. Uh, you get, you know, you know that elasticity is two-thirds that's equal to zero. So for very small cost of transaction, the elasticity of median times of trade with respect to C is two-thirds. Okay? So if C increases, you get two thirds of your trade. This comes from this, this result here. Okay. Now, near c equal to zero. Okay, that's that's uh, that's. Um, I don't want to get to that. I wanted to go to the last point. Now, if you look at the elasticity of the bubble with respect to c, the, the value of the bubble, remember, is what would you pay because you can retrade, versus what would you pay if you had to hold it forever, right? So the elasticity of the bubble with respect to C, as C goes to zero, goes to zero. Okay. So what's happening here? When you, suppose you follow Tobin's proposal. So Tobin's proposal is that we tax trading. Okay. Suppose you start in a situation where there's no cost of trading, there's very little cost of trading, and you increase the cost of trading. What's going to happen? Okay. The median number of times is going to increase quite a bit, because that's going to increase essentially to the tax to the two-thirds. So we're going to decrease the number, increase the number, increase the uh, median time to trade, 
which means you're going to decrease the volume of trade by a lot. On the other hand, nothing's going to happen to the bubble. To a first order, nothing happens to the bubble near C equal to zero. So a Tobin tax will be very effective in cutting trade. And if that's what you want, you just don't want to see the noise of trading, that's probably a good idea. But what if you want to do is lower the bubble, that's much less effective. But that's what modeling can do for you. You know, it can give you an idea, things which are proposed that look interesting. You don't have any data to check to try it, because those things they haven't been tried enough. Yes, that's missing that's in the model. Well, maybe yes, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure you have to invest. Huh? Yes, yes. That's a different problem. That's a different problem. I think is a serious problem. I think too many people go to Wall Street. I believe, even though I train, Darrow trains a lot of them. I train a lot of them. But I agree. But that's more like being able to. That's outside the model. Absolutely. So. OK, there's a bunch of related models, because I want to spend the last 15, 20 minutes, in fact, because I have until four or five, I think, because I started late. Um, there's a bunch of other models, some of which I want to mention here. There's, there's a finite horizon model uh, that introduces PDEs, because if you have a finite horizon now, you cannot only think about the difference of opinions, you have to think about time. No. No, there's no, those people are risk neutral. They can borrow on land uh, at, at a fixed rate. There's no resource constraint. That's going to play an important role. This is item, this, this bubble. Okay? So there are two ways you can introduce uh, resource constraint. You can introduce risk aversion, which is a form of resource constraint because the bigger your position, the more risk you're going to have. Okay? Or you can introduce limited capital. So the pessimists and the optimists, they may have different amounts of, they may have, you know, they start with a certain amount of capital, and some of that capital, they may make more money or lose money, okay? So you can do both of those things. Now, what is important about that? I have a paper with Hong and Shong exactly on this case. It's a relatively simple model, a two-period model. What you learn is that supply matters now. Now the total amount of the asset that exists, okay, uh, would matter. For risk neutral guys, there's no resource constraint. You're absolutely right. And supply matters, and large supply is associated with smaller bubbles and smaller turnover. So that goes back to the idea that bubbles end by an increase in supply. If you increase the supply by enough, you run out of crazy people. They all have enough of the stuff, and that's your resource constraint. That's not a problem. Having an upper bound is not a problem. Having an upper bound, that's very easy to do. But it's much more difficult is to introduce risk aversion or, or capital requirement, which is really a resource constraint. There's no <coughs> problem with upper bounds. So there are two effects on prices. You're absolutely right. One effect of price, one effect on price on the prices, come from the fact the optimist may be very crazy. So that effect is there. I'm trying to take here kind of an agnostic position. I don't know who is right. Maybe the optimists are right, and it's the same thing that happens with bubbles, right? You don't really know what the fundamental valuation really is. That's why we look for these different implications that have nothing to do with price. It's really hard to discuss just prices bubbles because who knows who knows who is right okay. so the opinion so what I call a bubble is not the fact that these guys are very optimistic what I call a bubble is that they are optimistic and they're willing to bid more than the, what they they think it's worth why are they willing to bid more because even though Nobu is pretty moderate guy at this point tomorrow he may go even crazier so it's the idea that the, the bubble is not the fact that maybe we'd imagine Today, that Facebook or whatever is going to give you riches, a lot of dividends on. That's fine. Some people must believe that. 
But there are also people who buy those companies. What so this last IPO, which went crazy. In the, what, Slack? <coughs> Slack. Slack went at three times the price in the first day. Okay? So the people buying that stuff, you could think, oh, the people buying this stuff is just because they think Slack. I don't even know what Slack does. Slack is a marvelous company, and it's going to give them riches, and they're going to retire in Monte Carlo or in Tel Aviv, which would be a great place to retire. But that's one possibility. That's not what I'm calling a bubble. Maybe they're right. Maybe Slack would be wonderful. But they're willing to pay even more than they think the value is because they're buying Slack at this three times the IPO price because they think the next week there's going to be somebody who's going to give them four times what the IPO price. What do you think describes better the, the... I think that the second phenomenon is more interesting for an economy. The other is just views. I mean, people can diverse on the, on the, have their diverse views. Yeah, but that's what this literature is trying to get out of. You know, just forget it. You know, price is just too hard. I can't say enough things about prices that convince me that's a bubble or not. But trading volume, I think, is much more interesting because you measure better and you don't really know why people start all of a sudden. Stock goes up by a lot and then people trade like crazy. I bet I didn't look at the trading on Slack. I can bet with you, which was very high. Okay, I can bet whatever you want. Uh, and then the second point is that you have the thing about how bubble stops. They've got the bubble stops because supply increases. That's an interesting phenomenon, too. So those are phenomena we don't have to discuss. I have this view, you have this view. I just think that just discussing prices is like useless. Maybe somebody will come up with something really clever to say about prices. But in your model, from the viewpoint of a given agent, there's uh, an explicit uh, calculation for the expected uh, rate of growth of price before the next transaction. Do right. You boundary? Yes. And you know your drift? Yeah, you can compute that, yeah. That's how we compute this expected time for trade, median time to trade. Especially near C equal to zero, they're easier to compute. You know, using stuff from, you know, old statistics by now, old stochastic, huh? first heating time stuff. That's how we do that. Yes, uh, so this is one thing, yeah. Huh? If it's possible? Okay, so one attempt, which is related to that, is this paper by Cho and Casa, which I urge anybody who's very theoretically inclined to look at it. The paper is not completely correct. I know that there's some problems in the paper, but the idea is very good. And the idea in the paper Cho and Casa is that ages use this distorted probability, you know, the stuff that Sargent and, and Hansen have been worked with. So they use these distorted probabilities that reflect worst case scenarios subject to some kind of distortion penalty. In a world like this, you get, because you're holding the asset, the guy who's holding the asset is, has a smaller drift because he's more pessimistic. I mean, his worst case scenarios are worse. That's the point. than the guy who doesn't hold anything. So then you're getting endogenous disagreement. The paper's kind of clever, but technically it's a tough problem and they didn't it's not fully correct. But I think the idea is very good. They say Tom Sargent gave them the, this idea, and I, I could believe it. It's the kind of thing that Tom would think about. Okay? Any more questions? Okay. So, this is, so the important thing to remember here, I'll talk about some of the stuff in the next thing, is this risk aversion limited capital story. This, um, we'll talk about in large areas. It's also a very pretty paper by Dumai and all, which is kind of a complete market version of something like this. Kind of interesting. Uh, there's a finite dimensional stuff and so on. Now, before I go, I want to discuss uh, two th one thing very small. I, I'll start treating the same thing and leave it for, for next class, the rest. But first, I want to show you this, this graph, which is or this one graph. So there's a paper by Xiong and Yu. Uh, uh, the American Economic Review 2011, as I said, everything is there, um, who looks at the Chinese Warren bubble. Now, the Chinese Warren bubble is a very interesting phenomenon because it was a, in, in the early 2000s, about 18 Chinese companies issued put warrants on their stock. They typically, they, when they were going public, they also issued a put warrant. So the buyer of the put warrant had the right to sell the stock back to the company at a fixed price. 
Um, now, just after that, there's a huge run up of the, of, of, of the Chinese market, which makes, as you understand, a put option very, very, gives very little value to put option at the old prices. So what they did, they looked at the Black Shoals option pricing for these warrants that were worth they selected the one, the, the many of them, in fact, they look at all of them, but many of them were worth less than 5% of one hundredth of a yen. Now, if you think a yen is 8 to the dollar, 6 to the, what is it now, yen? There are Chinese students here. A little bit of 7. A little bit of 7 to the dollar. 7 to the dollar, so divide by 100, you have 7 penny, and then you take 5% of 7 pennies. We can call that zero. Okay, so that's what they did. So for those, it's very easy to, call, to compute the bubbles. One case where you actually can find the price. Because the price is the price. The price is, is whatever price I think is trading is the bubble. Right? Because we know that this number is, is zero. Okay, so, so the bubble is this difference. And then, here's the graph. Okay, now... Here's a graph for one particular company. Now, the Chinese students here would know this company. Apparently, it's very famous. They produce liquor. They have big sellers, right? <laughs> big sellers of liquor. So maybe that's what the buyers were in. They were consuming a lot of the product before trading. But because it's kind of amazing when you look at the graph. So here's the Black Shoals price of this corporation. You know, it comes sometime in the middle of seven, April of seven, it's zero. It's just Excel doesn't put the thing at the axis. It always puts above just a little above, but when it gets there, it's because it's zero. So by the time it's zero, now the Warren price here, and you can see why, look at what happens to stock price, that's the stock price shot, shoots up, the put is worthless, right? So now, <clears throat> here's the Warren price, now you look at the other thing, even though the price should be zero, it's close to two yen each. So people are paying for that a lot. So that's the first thing. And they pay for that for a long time. He reaches this crazy price here of 8 yen. And if H okay converges to zero, that's the finite horizon aspect to it. You know, in the finite horizon model, eventually everybody has to agree because the stuff, the day comes, and it is, or the, fi the end of the day comes, and that's going to be very important. Huh? How should the one be worth given that the patient is the same company? In other words, they promise to buy back their shares I don't know how, what the Chinese regulators did, how did they, maybe they took part of the IPO and had to put it in bonds. It would be even worse then. Because you're saying the warrant should be worth less than what you're saying. If it was less than what you're saying, that's even crazier. That's even crazier. So I'm giving you a lower bound and you're saying it's even crazier than that because the, the warrant should uh, it would be worth even less than that. I'm saying it's all already zero. You're saying you would have been zero even earlier. That's what you're telling me. So, so that's the warrant price. It kind of converges, as you have to be. Now, the typical warrant, so they took all the warrants whose Black Shoals price was under that, that barrier, so let's call it a zero price. Uh, they had an average daily, daily turnover. We're talking about annual turnover of 328%. People are trading that stuff. I was going to say that's something else, but I won't say it to be respectful. You were trading that stuff, okay? So that's it. That's that's they're really trading that stuff. But then you look at the last trading day of each one of those 18 stocks. Now, how what is the chance of something happened the last trading day? You know, the you know you look at uh, it gets worse because there's some limits on how much prices can change in China. I want to get us into this. The average one of those trade 100 percent every 20 minutes. That's, that's trading for you, right? We're talking about 100% a year. Now we're thinking about 100% every 20 minutes. That's trading for you. The trading volume, the warrant of the stock, the Wulang Li, reached 1,841% of that warrant's float in the last trading day. That's not very different than 20, than, than 100% every 20 minutes. I don't, I don't remember how long the stock was mar market was open. So the other thing is you can look at the size of the price bubble on a warrant. And you see it's positively related with trading volume. That's the idea, the trading volume and price. That's the thing of the model. 
it's negative, it's, 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 it's positively related with time to expiration, and negative related, correlated with the float, which is this idea, the more of the stuff there is, the more crazy people you need, and so the price, so it's kind of an interesting thing, the more liquid something is, in this case it gets a smaller price. In the normal world, Darrow has papers on this, more liquid stuff gets a higher price, it's kind of liquidity premium. Here you get a liquidity discount, because it's very hard to find enough crazes when you have a lot of the stuff around. That's the limited capital. Who had asked about limited capital? You did. I'm not like Yarrow. I, I can't get names, so don't even try. But you did, the guy with the blue shirt there. Um, so anyway, so there are other st papers like this. So I want to use my last five minutes just to talk about a little bit of that. I'll finish next class. So one important, one important uh, line of work on difference in beliefs is a line that was started by John Janakopoulos. The one I'm going to cover here is a paper by Simsek, but it's inspired on, on Janakopoulos' work. But it's, it's kind of more clear, uh, as Darrow says, Simsek can take any problem and make it absolutely clear. So, and this is an example of that. So, you look at a two-period model, okay, and you have one safe asset with a unit rate of return. Think of it as being cash. And you have one risky asset that pays S in the state of the world S. So the state of the world is, the, is, is, is identical to the payoff of, the, of this risky asset. Okay? And S can be a number between S min and S max. And people are going to write contracts. But the contracts here are, more, are going to be more like real, real world contracts than sometimes economists think about contracts. So they're, they're going to be trading a competitive market. They're going to constitute, they are going to have three parts. A contract is going to have a promise, how much you get in state S, that's part of the contract, is going to have a collateral of, this, of the asset, how many units of, I mean, a collateral of cash, how many units of cash you're going to hold, which is alpha, and a collateral of the asset, how many units gamma you're going to hold of the asset. That's going to define a contract, okay? And what you're going to do is that you're going to be, have a bunch of risk neutral traders, that are only care for consumption t equal to 1. They're going to be optimists and pessimists. The optimists are going to have a distribution F1, the pessimists a distribution F0, with 1 having a higher expected value for S. But after all, the payoff is S. Unit mass of each type. The trade of type I is endowed with Ni units of cash, so the we N0 and N1. So here, resources are going to play a role. Uh, there's one unit of the asset which is supplied inelastically. Somebody had that asset, Darrow had that asset, and decided just to sell whatever price he can, he can get. Uh, and the lender, so, so people on the contract, they're going to, we're going to figure out, so there's a promise to pay, and there's a lender, okay? And we're going to figure out how much the lender is going to be entitled. The fact is there's limited liability. The lender is not going to get the payoff that was Promise, the promised phi of s. The lender knows that he's going to get the minimum between phi of s and the value of the guarantees. This is what the finance people call a no recourse contract. I think Noble talk about no recourse contract. It's a non recourse contract. You sign a contract, you promise a certain amount of money in certain states of the world. State of the world come, the guy says, look, this is what you have. I, uh, uh, I, I, I gave us guarantees. You can walk with the guarantees if you want. So of course you only do that if what you promise is less, is more than what the guarantees are worth. So that's a non-recourse contract. Okay? So given the set of allowable contracts, the equilibrium det determines which contracts are going to be traded. There's a set of contracts to be traded. Uh, the amount borrowed at zero when issued a contract beta, which I'm going to call Q of beta, and the asset price P. The asset, the original asset price P. So everything is going to be determined equally. Now, we're going to look at something called simple debt contracts. Those are relatively very simple contracts. Those are contracts which tell, I'll give in every state the same amount. Okay? They're not risk free because you, you're going to give guarantees and you may default on your guarantees. But if you pay, you pay this always the same amount. But for those contracts, we're going to normalize it. So you always give one unit of the collateral, that's a normalization of the asset, and you give no cash, because any cash you have given, you just can promise to pay the difference. So there's no point in keeping cash. It's just uh, 
there's no loss of net value. And we're going to talk about two elements, something called margin and something called leverage. The well, leverage Nobu used yesterday a lot, margin two, I think. So the margin is the difference between the price and what you can borrow on the, on the asset. So the difference is what you have to put yourself, that's what's called your margin, divided by the price. That's a proportion of the price. That's called the margin. Because I just was talking percentages. But it's really generated by the difference between what you pay for the asset and what you can borrow in the asset. How much money you have to put yourself. How much skin in the game you have to have. And the leverage is simply one over the margin. So it's a perfect function from one to the other. That's the way it's going to happen. We're going to show that. Okay, so how are we going to show that? So we're going to make some assumptions. Um, the first assumption is that the amount of cash that the optimists have is less than what they think the asset is going to pay off minus the minimum amount that, you can, that the asset can pay off. What does that mean, this difference? It means that these guys don't have enough money to bid their expected payoff. They don't have enough cash for that. Because in order, if they were going to bid their expected payoff, they'll have to give guarantees or be able to buy the asset. But knowing that, only Asmin, you know, the thing can, can be as bad as Asmin. So they can't, they can't bid their expected payoff, borrow enough to bid their expected payoff. And I'm also going to assume there's a lot of cash in the, in the hand of the pessimist, okay? More than what the optimists think minus whatever cash they have. So the sum of the cash cannot pay also the expected payoff. Okay. All right. Now, that's pretty simple. So we know that the total cash is more than what the optimists think the asset is worth. Okay. So in equilibrium, this is going to be the maximum price. Some traders are going to end up holding cash. Can't we all go to the assets? Only one asset. It's worth for the most optimistic guy is working one of S, so there's going to be some cash left over. So these traders are going to get a gross return of unity in equilibrium. Okay. Uh, so there's only one kind of interior equilibrium. Okay. An interior equilibrium is one where the optimists just hold the, ca the asset and no cash, and the pessimists hold cash. They land, they finance, they finance and hold cash. Okay. So the pessimists then have to lend and get no surplus because they're going to hold cash. Some pessimists are going to hold, at the margin, are going to hold cash, so you can't get any surplus. So that means they're going to lend the expected payoff, what they think the thing is, their expected payoff is going to be. They know they're going to get the minimum between S and whatever phi they promise. So that's not of that is there, is what they lend. I think I started, when did I start it? A little bit over. So then I, sh so I should finish now. Okay, so I just finished this, this couple slides and we stop. Okay, so because you're not leaving any surplus, you can formulate this as a principal agent problem. You can think, oh look, the optimists are going to maximize their utility subject to the fact that the pessimists have to get at least their own, uh, the pessimists get exactly their, the expected value of the minimum between S and phi. So that's what the pessimists are going to get. And now, a solution to this problem, so they're going to choose the amount they, they are going to uh, uh, purchase of the asset and they get the contract phi. Okay. And what is necessary is that demand is equal to supply. So what's the demand for cash? The demand for cash is going to be the price of the asset times the amount of the asset you buy. They bring N1 to the table, but they have to borrow, borrow the rest. The amount they're going to borrow per asset is going to be at the expected value of the pessimist of the mean between S and phi, and that multiplied by X is going to be the amount of cash that the pessimists are going to get. Okay? So, an equilibrium is a solution to this principal agent problem that has associated with it x star equal to 1. Okay. And what you do is that you solve this equilibrium. It's not very complicated. And you end up with a formula for the price, which is very intuitive. The price ends up being 
a weighted average, or no, weighted average of two expectations. Okay. What are these expectations? On the one hand, you figure out what do optimists, remember, the ones expect the asset to be at the very when s goes above five, okay, when the state turns out to be very good. And you weight that and what pessimists want to be on the bad state. Because the pessimists, they worry about the bad states, right? They are lending money. They know in the bad states, they're not going to get their promise. They're going to get just S. So the price is, is just phi by mixture of beliefs, okay? Condition this phi, we haven't yet solved for the phi. Optimists believes about the false states are irrelevant. Optimists don't care about the false states. They don't suffer any losses, let's say. But pessimists also don't care about the good states. So each one of them cares about one, and the equilibrium price ends up being the average. Okay, this is all algebra. And then you require market clean, which is the price has to be N1 plus that. And those two things together give the price. Now, let me give two minutes and then I'll stop. There's something very important here. There's a uniqueness result, but something very important that you can just look at the formulas and realize. Suppose I change the distribution for the optimist. There are two ways I can change the distribution of the optimist. I can, can they make them more optimistic about the bad states? What does that mean? I lower the weight of some bad states, the very bad states, okay? And then redistribute it, right? So then I'm making them more optimistic about the bad states. Or I can make them more optimistic about the good states. If I make them more optimistic about the bad states, what happens to the price? Making the optimist more optimistic about the bad states, what happens to the price? Huh? Nothing. Yes. You can say it loudly. Nothing. Why? Because in the pricing formula, as we argue, only the view of the optimist about the good states matter. They don't care about the bad states. So making more optimistic about bad states doesn't matter. If I make them more optimistic about the good state, that raises the price. Now, just to finish, I want you guys, without showing any slides, what happened in the CDO market. Now, how, what was the CDO like? You got something at a AAA rating, okay? Pay treasury plus a little bit. So what could you be optimistic about, the buyer of the CDO? What could the buyer of the CDO be optimistic about? Huh? The low default, so he could only be optimistic about the bad states. Low default rate are the bad states, right? Big default rate. He could only be optimistic. He could only hope for a low default rate. The good, the good state is fixed because the good state he was going to get you know, treasury plus a little bit. It's a fixed income in the scale, right? Okay, but what does this model tell you? That that optimist cannot explain the high prices of CDO. That form are optimist. I mean, it's not a, I mean, Simpson has notes like this, so you can see that in Simpson's paper. Okay? So this kind of model is very good, but it's hopeless to explain the CDO story. Because the CDO story can only have been about people saying, look, we have these instruments, they're so-called protected, which means they are bonds which have to default before they, you know, there has to be a lot of default before I get hurt. Right? So I'm protected. So the only way I could get hurt if there is a lot of bad stuff, okay, the very bad state. In fact, the bad systematic states, this doesn't play any role here, but it, the bad states and the bad systematic states, that's the only place I could lose money. Okay? And this model is telling you, well, that doesn't matter for pricing because the views of the optimists are irrelevant in the bad states. Okay, the Pessimists worry about the bad states, but not the optimist. So we need a different model. Next class, I'll tell you a little bit about what I think. Nobody has actually solved that problem. There's a sense, I mean, I have ideas, but there's a sense that which this problem has not been solved. I think the idea is that most of the lenders, and I'll go through next, next, uh, next time, but most of the lenders were people that were also optimists, but they were regulated, okay? So a bank cannot buy houses. Typically a bank cannot buy housing. But if I'm optimistic about a housing bubble, what can a bank do? 
well, since housing prices are going to go up, I can lend money to anybody who walks off the street, even though they may have no income or something, because they're always going to be able, always going to, be able to take their houses back and make money. So I lend a lot of subprime. Now, the bank doesn't have that many resources, so they lend all their money. How they get more money? Well, there's these guys, these money market types managers, who are also very optimistic about housing. They cannot buy houses, money market fund cannot be own houses, but what can do, they can issue commercial paper, charge a little bit more, and sell it to the banks, and buy commercial paper from the banks, I'm sorry. They can buy commercial paper from the banks with a little, little better rate, so the banks can now finance a lot more housing. Now, the money market funds is getting cash from institutions, typically if many firms keep their cash there. They cannot buy houses, you know, Shell that was mentioned here, Robert Dutch Shell, cannot say, oh, I have some cash, I'm going to buy some houses. Tomorrow I may need that cash, I sell the houses. That's not a business model for Shell. So what Shell does is that they give the, put the money on a money market fund. But that money market fund, who in turn was lending to the bank, then was lending money to the mortgage, that money market fund pays a little spread. And people have looked at the data, and that's true. They pay a little spread. So now you lend your money to the money market fund. So create a chain of optimists which are regulated that support the leverage of the housing market or eventually of the CBS. Thank you guys. I went over my time. Thank you.